So have a look here. Let's revise again the ploidy status. If you look at it, complete mole are diploid, where partial mole are triploid, right? And complete moles are mostly monospermic. They could be diaspermic as well. Partial moles are mostly diaspermic. The genetic material in case of a complete mole is entirely paternal, right? And we're talking about the nuclear DNA material, uh, okay? And in the partial mole, the extra material is paternal. That's another important point. And now let's talk more about this P57 KIP2 immunostaining, right? Now let's talk more about this P57 KIP2 immunostaining, right? Now this P57 KIP2 protein can be detected in the conceptus and this gene that encodes for this protein is paternally silenced and only expressed maternally, right? So as far as genetics is concerned, I mean, you know, Conceptus gets um, half of the copies from the mother and half of the copies from the father, right? And uh, when we call them as alleles, remember? Now, what will happen here is sometimes uh, certain alleles are expressed, certain alleles are suppressed, okay? Now, this is one gene that is paternally silenced and only expressed the ones that are inherited from the mother's side. Only those alleles are expressed. Now, let's have a look. In a complete mole, all the genetic material, all the nuclear genetic material is paternal. No maternal nuclear DNA material is there, right? So, will this protein be synthesized? No, right? So, in complete mole, the P57 KIP2 immunostaining is going to be negative. Whereas in partial mole, right, the maternal genetic material is there, right? The extra material is paternal. Maternal genetic material is there. So, will this protein be expressed? It's maternally expressed. Yes, it will be expressed. So, this immunostaining will be positive, right? So, I remember it as a shortcut, P for partial mole, P for positive. So, P57 KIP2 immunostaining is positive in partial mole cases, all right? Now, grossly, if you look at it, how are complete mole and partial mole different? So, let's have a look at these diagrams. In a case of complete mole, there is extensive, as you can see in this image, extensive trophoblastic proliferation. There is no maternal genetic material. So, how can a viable fetus or anything of that kind form? So, it is going to have absolutely no fetus there. And there is extensive proliferation of these trophoblasts, right? And that is going to synthesize excessive of beta HCG that is going to come from this extensively proliferated trophoblast. Whereas if you look the gross of uh, partial mole cases, these are triploid, okay? Triploid with an extra genetic material coming from the father's side. So they can't form normal conceptors, right? So there is a fetus. There is a fetus, right? There is an embryo. But that fetus is not going to be normal. It is going to be abnormal. If it does grow to some extent, it will have maybe certain congenital anomalies. It will be grossly deformed. Most of the time, it dies. Okay, so this is not normal. This is abnormal. And most of the time, it also dies. And again, there will be trophoblastic proliferation, which is going to be extensive as compared to what is seen in a normal placenta, but not as extensive as seen in a complete mole. So, we can have this appearance of a placenta which looks, um, you know, enlarged, uh, which could also look uh, to have cystic spaces, right? So, when you look at the proliferation, the proliferation is not as, as extensive. It may be proliferation in certain, certain parts. And you can see here, this is characteristically described as the swollen chorionic villi. You see here, there is hydropic degeneration. This is what we call as hydropic degeneration 
of the chorionic villi. Right? These chorionic villi are swollen and edematous. So, remember these differences. Okay? In a complete mole, the fetal or embryonic tissue is completely absent and it is going to be present in case of a partial mole, but the fetus is going to be abnormal. Remember that. Hydropic swelling of the chorionic villi in cases of complete mole is going to be complete and extensive. Whereas in case of partial mole, the hydropic swelling of the chorionic villi is partial. It's not as extensive and we'll commonly see it as a cystic placenta. Okay, the trophoblastic proliferation with complete mole is extensive. Whereas in case of a partial mole, it is going to be not as extensive. In fact, it is described as trophoblastic scalloping. It is described as trophoblastic scalloping, which is a histopathological finding that we see. As far as the vascularity of villi is concerned, the chorionic villi get vascularized from the fetal vessels. The fetus is absent in a complete mole. So, the villi are going to be avascular. Okay, there's no going to be any fetal RBCs that can be seen on histopath of a complete mole. Whereas in the case of partial mole, yes, some villi could be vascular, some villi could be avascular. So, vascularity is present, yes, but in parts. Partial vascularity, you could say like that. And yes, excessive beta HCG is going to be a hallmark of molar pregnancies. With complete mole, uh, the levels tend to be very high, mostly more than 10 to the power 5 international units per liter. With partial mole, however, lesser as compared to complete mole, so less than 10 to the power 5 international units per liter. This is usually so. This is usually so, but the levels could be uh, different and variable also. Now, also remember that all these differentiating features in a case of complete versus partial mole, these are seen on histopathological examination of this gross tissue that is sent for histopathological evaluation. So, whatever might have been the clinical profile which we are going to discuss next or the you know levels of beta HCG or let us say the ultrasound findings, the 100 percent confirmation whether it is a complete mole or a partial mole is based upon the histological findings right on the histopathological examination of the removed products of conception. Keep that in mind. Thank you.